Good evening. I'm very happy to welcome you for tonight's lecture and podium discussion. Tonight we have Christopher Davis from the Archaeology Department of the University of Durham, Kai Weiser um, from Kathmandu, and um, the discussion is moderated by Dieter Geisbühler, who, as most of you know, is a professor in our school. Um, and he will lead then after two inputs um, from our guests um, through tonight's discussion. Um, the claim of this semester's event or evening lectures is that architecture is politics. And we have three evenings. A few weeks ago, we had the evening about climate. And I think it was evident um, that climate is very much about politics, about political structure decisions, and at the end of the day, about us, our lives, our societies. Um, Tonight, I think, is just as interesting and just as important as a discussion. Um, the UNESCO World Heritage is something I think everybody of us knows. Um, we go and visit these sites. We think, at least, that these sites are um, extremely special. Um, to us, to our culture, to other cultures within the history of mankind. But I think, at least myself, um, I've never really asked myself, well, you know, what are the implications um, if we call a monument or a whole landscape, um, if we put this under protection of the heritage? Um, what are the political implications? What are the implications for a city, for a community? Um, is it about tourism? What happens with tourism? I think this is also one of the very big questions. Um, if you look at sites like Angkor Wat, or um, well, there's many, many more, um, who, are, no, who have a tendency of being run over by tourists, and then who might have to be protected again from tourists. Um, Maybe you know, 20 years ago you could walk just through sites like this. Today you have railings, you have boundaries, you, um, the sites are again protected from visitors. And then there are other sites like um, here in Switzerland um, that are extremely strong, extremely beautiful and basically nobody knows about them and nobody goes there. So anyway, I'm very, very happy um, that you two could come and engage in this discussion. I'm very happy, Kai, that you came. I just told your colleagues before, we um, studied together 30 years ago in Zurich. Um, so we have a short history together. We met uh, again 10 years ago in Kathmandu. And um, yeah, I'm really happy that you could come um, from Kathmandu um, to be with us tonight and with the master students tomorrow. And now I will give the podium to Dieter Geispieler first to introduce the two gentlemen. Thank you very much. Okay, good evening also. And I'm really also very pleased to uh, be able to have this topic here. Maybe it would have had some more uh, resonance with the students. That would be happy, or I would be happy with. But anyway, that's the way it is. I have to deal with maybe politics are not that interesting at that actual time. Huh? Maybe they're too crucial. Okay, I start with a short introduction uh, of the two at the same point, then they will do their inputs, and at the end we will do a discussion. I, of course, have prepared some questions, but of course, we'll be happy if we can have a discussion with the audience much more than just to answer my questions here. So the two are, Kai Weise has said, he's uh, 
I guess Nepali in the meantime, with Swiss origins, that's uh, how it's uh, called. Uh, I guess his father went to Nepal and uh, took him, you with him there? Yeah, I'm no? Born there. Yeah, you're, you're born there, as you see. So. But then he studied uh, at the ETH in Zurich. In Zurich. He finished there in 1992. We have met also, but maybe just in the cafeteria, so we don't remember that uh, that uh, happened there. Uh, but afterwards, he returned to Nepal and he worked there as an architect, a municipal planner, or city planner, or planner in the general sense overall, in 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 the whole region, I guess, not only in Nepal, but mainly Nepal. And from there, he got into that uh, uh, field of uh, the UNESCO consultant. So he's not part of the staff of, of UNESCO, but he's really consulting UNESCO and advising the UNESCO, uh, and especially the UNESCO office in Kathmandu, I think. Or there he's sort of in charge of uh, some official uh, position uh, for the UNESCO. Uh, of Nepal. Uh, he also, I think he will talk about that tomorrow a little bit more, his, uh, and, and tonight also, uh, he's now dealing especially with management systems for world heritage, what that means he will tell us, and it's quite interesting, uh, although management sounds for the first a little bit uh, uh, critical for architects. Uh, especially in the Kathmandu Valley and Lumbini in Nepal, but he worked also in Samarkand, Spekisa. Uh, uh, and as he mentioned before, and we had sort of a short discussion on mountain railways of India uh, and Bagan that he's working on now or, or has been working on, which uh, is a spe special topic that we also know here that railways become part of world heritage. And as he mentioned before, it's a completely different thing than once you deal with with uh, railways and not with buildings anymore. Uh, so he is basically uh, establishing guidelines uh, for, or he was, and uh, for the management of those properties. Uh, but uh, since some disasters happened, he's also mainly uh, right now into the, this dealing with uh, follow-up work after uh, disasters happened uh, on the impact on heritage and what comes out of that. And he lectured uh, in this field, of course, all over, and especially also in our country, in Japan, also India, China, uh, and Korea. And I don't know if you also mentioned sometimes Italy, but I think it's, it's all these countries that at a certain point in our history have really suffered under, under major earthquakes. And, uh, this is a, a strong connecting term, I think, of your work and uh, important part. I hope to hear something about that too. There's some writing that you can find on him, quite interesting one that I sh very briefly got into. Uh, and also talking about quite interesting issues, we, we might get to that uh, later on. So, Kai is an architect. And then, the second person here is uh, Christopher Davis, Chris, uh, and he is an archaeologist, archaeologue, uh, and studied in bachelor and master in archaeology at Durham University, where he's still working which is uh, one of the epicenters of, uh, I think, archaeology, not only in, in England, but uh, is a very important uh, uh, university that deals with those issues uh, that uh, probably not that many of us are really familiar with, but are, which are a very important part of sort of looking into cultural heritage as a whole. Uh, this has an interesting PhD uh, thesis he did, uh, which really struck me, and it was on early Buddhist, monast Buddhist monasteries in Sri Lanka, that's sort of normal, but then comes a landscape approach, and I hope we really get into that, that shows that we are not so 
or not only building concentrated or uh, focused or they are and that's I think is a quite interesting issue also to talk about afterwards. His study integrated there and um, that shows a little bit what it's into the archaeological evidence from excavations but also landscape survey with epigraphic, I call it in, in German, so because you might not know what it is, it's the Inschriften in, in, in different uh, parts, uh, uh, textual and ethnographic sources, so it's issues as a complex system and that's uh, probably a very, very interesting topic to get a little bit deeper. He's now uh, 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 working with UNESCO in, in, in different fields and especially in the, in the key part, I think, is the natal landscape of Buddha. That's uh, where he's really uh, strongly into since his PhD, obviously, uh, and very important. That's also, I think, in that surrounding that the two have got, the, the two of them met. So uh, there, in some ways, one gets the feeling of a team. They discuss in a very specific manner together. So that means they, they know each other quite well and it looks like they know each other from their work and their interest in, in the work they're doing. So I think we have a very interesting combination of an architect and an archaeologist. One dealing with basically building up, the other one with trying to excavate what's left and what comes out of the combination I think is crucial for dealing with cultural heritage uh, and especially when it comes to settlements of the, in the broadest sense, as they obviously look at the thing not only as a building but as a system uh, that uh, uh, needs to be understood and that also gives us some information about what uh, we could do in the future. But this is already part maybe of the discussion, so I give you the floor and Kai, as I said, will start and then we get back onto some of the topics. Maybe to come some more. We'll see. <laughs> Good evening. Um, so after that long introduction, uh, I'm, yeah, I'm not quite sure what exactly I should be talking about. Uh, however, again, it was sort of the title where you have architecture and politics uh, and then linking that to heritage. And I have 15 minutes to say something and I have lots to say. So uh, I took out some very specific points and uh, I wanted to first start with this concept of architecture and politics and uh, this is the royal palace in Kathmandu. This was a, uh, the medieval royal palace where the king lived till the end of the 19th century and he was moved to this neoclassical palace by the Rana prime minister. So the prime minister took over power. Uh, they tried to emulate the British colonial uh, powers in India. And even though Nepal was never colonized, it was actually the own prime ministers who sort of introduced this architecture. And they took over full control. So the king didn't have control for about a little over 100 years. And they forced him to live in this palace. And so once uh, in 1951, the king, with the support of the, the government of India, who by then had gotten rid of the British, uh, he, the, the king got his power back and decided that he needed a new type of architecture to represent the new Nepal. So more or less, you can see that you have the original uh, medieval palace and politically seen, this, the, 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 the Rana prime ministers presented their power through uh, this neocolonial style, as with the British uh, in India, and they developed this new architecture. So the king wanted a new Nepali architecture. 
This was a design that was proposed by my father, who was an architect who studied in Switzerland. And this was in 1960, before I was born. Uh, but this was not built. It was actually, in the end, uh, the, the project that was built was by Chatterjee and Polk. And this was supposed to represent the new Nepal, sort of the, an architecture that would sort of uh, incorporate the, the, the sort of the style, the Nepali style, into a, a modern interpretation. So here you can already see clearly how architecture was taken as uh, sort of a, an expression of the power linking that to sort of the, the cultural identity. Now another story which actually my father was involved in is there was a small kingdom called Sikkim exist, that existed between Nepal and Bhutan, so in the Himalayas. And uh, till the, the beginning of the 1970s it was an independent country. And the king at the time wanted to develop his own style of architecture. And he, uh, because he was sort of under pressure from India, uh, the, 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 he wanted to create his own identity. So my father actually got the assignment to create this Sikkimese style of architecture. Uh, however, in 1973 there were protests and by 1975 it was merged into India, uh, so it never did uh, survive. But again, at the point of time, you're creating this identity through architecture uh, as an expression of, of the local culture. Uh, I did my uh, architecture in Zurich. And my topic was uh, the old city of Kathmandu. And it was uh, interesting because at the time, well, it was a bit contentious because not many people knew about Kathmandu and they first didn't want <laughs> to let me do this as my topic. Uh, but then in the end, they agreed. And uh, this was sort of really trying to understand the old city uh, and its, its context, which at the time I wasn't, I had no idea that I'd be working with conservation and uh, historic settlements. Uh, I went on to plan this, this is an earthen settlement in North Nepal, one of the, of the Tibetan culture. Uh, so I did a bit of planning there and then got into municipal planning. And in the process of working with the municipalities, one component was always looking at the traditional settlements and trying to find a way of uh, how, how can we actually deal with historic settlements in the changing sort of context. So, I mean, the people require, I mean, I guess we have a similar situation also in Switzerland, but there we still have a living cultural heritage which is linked to the medieval culture. So, how do we actually guide this development? And this was actually the basis for me to get involved in the Kathmandu Valley, uh, uh, which was already a World Heritage Site inscribed in 1979. Um, so Kathmandu Valley uh, consists of seven monument zones. So you have uh, more or less the, the three main city centers, two Buddhist stupas and two Hindu temple complexes. And uh, in 2003, uh, Kathmandu Valley was put on the danger list because of uncontrolled growth and loss of historic fabric. So more or less, it wasn't about the monuments itself, it was about the development that took place around uh, the monuments. And since I had been working with sort of uh, town planning and trying to deal with these kind of things, I got involved with the World Heritage Site. So my interest was not in con conservation at all. Actually, when I was at the ATI, I never went to the conservation classes, and uh, I, uh, so I was absolutely not interested in that. But I actually got involved because of the planning and trying to control that which was taking place around uh, the, the monuments. Uh, we worked on the management plan for Kathmandu Valley, and, uh, and it got taken off the danger list in 2007. And we were actually still working on reviewing the management plan when the earthquake struck 
Kathmandu. Um, so this is the center of Kathmandu. You can see the monuments, the palace area, and the main issue is ac actually what goes on around these monument zones. So in connection with management, uh, very often I'm not even dealing with the monuments. I'm dealing with uh, everything else that is taking place. So the management of a heritage site, the threats are usually linked to development, uh, uh, linked to you know, infrastructure, uh, traffic, uh, building codes and regulations around the, uh, the heritage sites. Okay, I think your voice is strong enough and this is rather disturbing that it's turning on and off. If you don't mind, I think you can just talk with uh, oh, sure. We, we, we can't really understand why this is happening. Uh, please in here. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so after Kathmandu Valley, I went on to, to work on the mountain railways of India, which is an industrial site. Then we have Lumbini, the birthplace of Lord Buddha, which is again a site, which is an archaeological site, but also a, a site of pilgrimage. And then uh, this, this is in Nepal. Then uh, Bagan in uh, Myanmar, uh, which is an archaeological site uh, with a, within sort of a uh, an agricultural landscape, and then Samarkand, which is on the Silk Road, uh, uh, well, several cities next to each other. Uh, and uh, the, the latest uh, site that I've been working on is in uh, Mrao, which is in Rakhine in Myanmar. So I'm sure most of you have heard of the conflict with uh, the Rohingyas, and so this is in that area, and this is part of the, the peace plan for the Rakhine area, where uh, we're trying to get Mrao, which is the ancient uh, city on the World Heritage List, uh, which is actually the Rakhine cultural heritage. So it's linked to giving the Rakhine people a, a sort of acknowledgement of their culture, and the conflict in the Rakhine is, of course, very complex because it's not only to do with the Rohingyas, which are, who are uh, Muslims, but we have other Muslims as well. We have the, the Rakhine that are Buddhist, and then the Burmese, who are also Buddhist. So it's actually a very complex situation there. And uh, within this context, working on the site has become quite a challenge. Now, the site itself is really interesting because uh, it was built within a very uh, interesting context where uh, they, they used water in many different ways. Also, uh, to defend the site where they had big reservoirs, which then they could flood areas if the uh, enemy attacked. And you had uh, from the sea, uh, more or less, the tides actually coming up the creeks into the city and streams going out. So it was, it's really the hydrology of the settlement is, uh, is extremely interesting. And now what we're trying to do is uh, re-establish that hydrology, which is presently a problem because we have floods since that entire system is not functioning anymore. So the complexity of the site on the one hand, but within the context of uh, the, the, the ethnic conflicts, uh, that sort of makes the entire uh, project uh, very uh, uh, challenging. Uh, in connection with coming to UNESCO, I just wanted to just put in a few points. One is more or less heritage something from the past, which is a value which is worthy of preservation. So I think we need to be clear that when we talk about heritage, it's something we're talking about value, and it's that we actually preserve it. If we have no intent in preserving it, then we shouldn't be calling it heritage. And for it to be world heritage, the value has to be of outstanding universal value. So it's something that is of great value. And uh, again, it has to always be linked to the need to conserve this. And with World Heritage, UNESCO is actually only the secretariat. It's the World Heritage Committee that makes the decision. So uh, the UNESCO actually only uh, sort of uh, is the secretariat to the convention. They cannot take any decisions, even though it's called the UNESCO 
convention. But, uh, but clearly, uh, you know, UNESCO is there only to, to, uh, to organize things. Um, now, to conclude, there's sort of a statement I want to make in connection with sort of the outcome of, of the work that I've been doing over the last years. And it's in connection with the changing definition of what we consider heritage. Uh, initially, we only looked at the exclusive type of heritage, which would be like the palaces and temples and sort of the big monuments. But today we're looking at more inclusive types of sites, which are uh, places where people live, uh, you know, sort of settlements and, uh, and how the normal people live as well, not only uh, the emperors and kings. And in the same way, you know, we initially we only looked at sort of the, the, the palatial gardens and today we look at uh, landscapes and sort of the rice terraces. So the whole definition of heritage has changed. Now, this again requires that we look at the management of heritage in a very different way. It has to go from a very autocratic uh, system where you conserve the heritage to something more democratic. So instead of uh, you know, putting a fence around the monument, you actually have to deal with living heritage where you have rituals and people living within the site, which cannot, you cannot talk about conservation. It's something, you know, so a lot of other activities going on, and we still haven't really figured out how to deal with these kind of sites. It's easy to put a fence around a monument or just say, okay, you're not going to change this, we, you know, we restore it as it was, but this link to a living heritage site is a problem. Now, if we look at the communities on the other hand, who are, who are these people who live within the site? We very, talk, very often talk about communities which are homogeneous, but very often these are in reality changing. We have communities that are transforming, and we, are, we also have communities that are changing from influx from the outside. And we have a heritage that is shared, for example, in Jerusalem uh, between the Jews and the Muslims, or then Prayer Vihar between Cambodia and uh, Thailand, where there was actually a small war because of uh, the site being put on the World Heritage List under Cambodia. Uh, so you have conflicts that take place between the different communities. Now, however, when we look at these sites, we need to look at uh, the resilience of these sites. So this was the, the earthquake in Kathmandu, where this temple totally collapsed. Now, to rebuild this, we are dependent on the communities and the artisans. So we have the big theories uh, of, uh, of conservation, but this cannot be rebuilt without the artisans and the resilience of the community. And so in the end, the question is, what does resilience actually mean in, in this context? which we need to have the artisans and the will to actually uh, ensure that this, this restoration is there. And we have, this can only be seen not in the sense of conservation, but as a, within the context of continuity. So it's not conservation that we should be focusing on, but on continuity, which is, I think, uh, a very different understanding towards heritage. Uh, so I'm going to stop. I, I, I'm not sure how many minutes I, I might have spoken too long, but, uh, but this is sort of uh, the outcome of 15 years of working. We realized that it's not only cons we're not really focusing on conservation, which is something very static. We need to look at heritage as something within uh, you know, the, the changing context, which means that we have to actually try to understand what is continuity and ensure this continuity. Thank you. So Kai's kind of given an introduction to the broader themes, the broader picture, and from a kind of, uh, a kind of heritage and cultural kind of background, but also an architectural one. And I'm gonna try and show some of the archaeological ideas we have about cultural heritage and world heritage and how we can maybe see some interfaces and interlinkings between archaeology and um, architecture. 
Um, just a bit of a background for Durham. We're uh, I'm based in the, the World Heritage Site itself. Um, and actually, we've been talking about issues of World Heritage in general. And at Durham, we have um, some of these challenges of being in a World Heritage Site because the university is actually one of the um, uh, uh, managers of part of the World Heritage Site. And so we have issues in places like Durham where we have students living in the castle. And so we have these balances between providing facilities for students to live in while also protecting the authenticity and the cultural values of that World Heritage inscription as well. I was also asked uh, for this talk to try and kind of provide a, a background to how we fit into UNESCO and as Kai kind of alluded to, UNESCO is this kind of has many kind of arms and, and wings and we're part of the UNESCO chair programme. So the UNESCO chair that we are in, we are in archaeological ethics and practice and cultural heritage. One of the things that we're looking at is how we can actually work in those kind of broad terms of uh, cultural heritage and ethics into furthering some of the ideas of, of UNESCO. So their fields of competence, so that does include heritage, but also linking to uh, challenges that we face in the international community, such as sustainable development goals. Um, part of our work also we need to work as bridge builders between different elements. It's not just academic, uh, we need to talk to uh, heritage practitioners, other parts of civil societies facilitating and being part of partnerships and strengthening uh, cooperation between different uh, groups. And also one of the things that we are uh, doing is trying to provide innovative research and try to find new ways of actually looking at some of these challenges that we actually face through heritage. So in terms of uh, Durham Chair, what we want to look at is some of the social and economic impacts of heritage. Obviously this relates to heritage and world heritage and just heritage more generally, but also looking at ways we can develop professional standards and responsibilities. And then part of that is then disseminating that, but also strengthening these partnerships, developing partnerships, and then also co-developing methods and approaches to kind of, again, look at these uh, difficult challenges that we all face relating to heritage. I'm here today to talk to you about it, but we are, I'm a small cog in a very large network. Um, our uh, uh, professor at Durham is Professor Robin Cunningham, who is the UNESCO chair, but this is our network of colleagues throughout the world who we work with to try and uh, face up to this challenge. So it's, it's not just uh, Durham University, but it's our partners like Kai, our colleagues in the Department of Archaeology in Nepal and throughout Asia who we work with. So Kai alluded to the issues of uh, the Nepal earthquake of the 25th of April and 12th of May in uh, 2015. And what we had was World Heritage Sites which were standing there, these architectural treasures, and then the earthquake occurred and how do we deal with these heritage sites once they are in this position. One of the things that we noted when we kind of, after the emergency phase, we started talking to colleagues like Kai to see what we could actually do in terms of our networks, archaeology, and actually understanding the ways to respond to this kind of catastrophic event. Um, one of the things we noted was that there was a lot of unchecked uh, digging and recording. So we had a lot of engineers and architects who were undertaking unrecorded excavations next to some of the damaged monuments. And one of the issues is, is that archaeology is destruction. We are removing things, but archaeology or excavation without recording is total destruction. So actually, a lot of these interventions, a lot of monuments fell in the earthquake damaging world heritage, but actually a lot more damage was occurring after this emergency phase as well. And this is something we wanted to look into. So one of the, the, the four major points we wanted to look at was the evaluation and assessment of foundations of damaged structures, trying to understand what issues there were below the ground, if any, uh, provide any if information regarding maybe the causes of collapse, why do certain monuments fall, why do other monuments not. Also, Whilst we can see above the ground, what's happening below the ground? Where are the earlier phases of development in the Kathmandu Valley? These again, they need protection. And also, as it's been said before, we are between earthquakes. 
there will be another one. How do we develop methods to actually be more prepared in terms of heritage uh, from an archaeological perspective when another um, catastrophic event like this occurs? So the case study is uh, the Kastamandap, the uh, eponymous monument of Kathmandu. This is a picture taken uh, in 2011. Um, it's a very large uh, satal or rest house in the middle of uh, Hanumandokra in Kathmandu city, which Kai was talking about. All we knew about this monument prior uh, to the earthquake was the architecture. We knew, uh, had very uh, beautiful drawings done of the above ground heritage, but nothing was known of below. Also, all we knew about this structure in terms of dating was from textual sources and traditions. And it led to uh, our colleague, and Professor Robin Cunningham, saying we need to look down and also not up. Because actually below, the, below this level here, we have no understanding. And we can't fully understand the monument if we don't know how this superstructure links into its foundations and how it was constructed. Uh, we undertook excavations. And as you can see, we found a uh, deep uh, foundations for the monument over two meters in depth. What was also interesting was we didn't really encounter any damage to these foundations. And these are strong foundations of brick with mud mortar, which we think allows for um, some flexibility during uh, seismic events. So actually, the history of the monument doesn't start at this level here. We have earlier sequences below which also need protection. And this is something to think about when we're approaching heritage sites in a post-disaster situation. There's lots of um, uh, need for rebuilding because monuments are not only social and religious monuments for people to worship and pray at, there's also an economic component because these are huge tourist attractions and economic um, uh, um, streams of revenue. Um, and so there is this pressure to rebuild, so it's important to understand what these monuments, how they were constructed. What we found was that a lot of the damage to the Castamandap had occurred in the kind of emergency phase, which is understandable. Um, in the rush to find uh, people, try to remove um, uh, bodies, uh, JCBs were mobilised in the days after to recover people, but actually this damaged a lot of the foundations of the monuments because again there was this not lack of understanding of how the monuments were below the paved uh, surfaces. This is an image that Kai took of the Castamander a few days after, and again it brings these issues of what is World Heritage, this building was standing, how do you approach a World Heritage site once it's now uh, uh, a collapsed building and rubble and debris around. So if we'd seen that most of the damage seemed to be from the kind of JCBs and we seem to find that the foundations of the monument was uh, quite resilient and had no damage, why did the monument collapse? So this is part of what we wanted to do as archaeologists with the team was try to understand how the monument collapsed, so then we could understand how it could then be reconstructed. You'll see here, this is the central shrine of the Kastamanda, and then you'll note that there is some saddle stones around here, and these are what links the superstructure into the foundations. But you'll also notice in the northeast, there is a, a missing saddle stone, there's just paving. So this, once we remove the rubble over the surface, we'd identified that there was a missing saddle stone. Where was this? Why wasn't it there? Could this have been a contributing factor to the issues of the collapse of the monument? When we excavated, you can see that the saddle stone is actually located directly below this paving. And actually, one of the uh, issues we found was the uh, pillar that was sat on top of this was uh, rotten and there was no tenon there. So actually, by excavating, carefully examining the monument, uh, talking to architects, we understood that actually some of the issues maybe were the causes of the collapse are not these traditional techniques and these uh, kind of techniques that have been developed over time, but actually issues with interlinking between architecture and the foundation. So the importance of actually understanding how these different elements fit together. 
Also in other places, we noted that some places where wooden posts should have been uh, linked in, there was concrete and cement fills, again, causing a lack of link between different parts of the monument. This is the foundations once uh, fully exposed. It forms this beautiful uh, mandala, a sacred cosmogram for the uh, monument, but also it shows again the foundations of the monument fairly intact, the saddle stones in place, no damage to this kind of subsurface heritage apart from the post-earthquake uh, interventions. Also, briefly, the investigations not only started to tell us about the traditional architectural techniques, it also showed us the dating of the monument. So rather than the traditional foundation of the 12th century or 16th century, actually we found that there was 2nd century BC human activity at the site, and actually the earliest monumental phase at the site was 700 uh, CE, so many years before it was thought. And actually what's interesting in this is actually thinking about the architecture and seismic adaptation of Kathmandu. If the foundations were strong, resilient, and the amount of earthquakes you have every 70 to 100 years in this region, this monument survived for 700 years, or these foundations have survived in their uh, from 700 CE, sorry, these foundations have survived several earthquake and catastrophic events in the Kathmandu Valley. Also, one of the techniques we wanted to use was looking at ground penetrating radar to look below the surface. So again, this idea of looking up and seeing the architecture around the area, actually what's below ground, it also needs enhanced protection at these sites. And actually on this image, you can see some black lines showing through, these are actually walls. So when we walk into the squares of the Kathmandu Valley, we're not actually just seeing the final and the phase as it always was, the morphology wasn't always like that. There were earlier phases of monumental development which need protecting. This is our excavations across the square. You can see several wall alignments and pavements all along here, just maybe 20 centimetres below the surface. So actually, in terms of uh, digging, these lines show what we have and what we needed to do or what we thought we could do was in development with colleagues is actually start to risk map areas. So monuments that are standing often thought need protection but what about the areas associated with these monuments? So not only are we actually identifying earlier phases of development, we're also identifying areas that need protection and actually what we can do is this risk mapping, so actually at World Heritage Sites or other heritage sites is actually identify areas at risk. So if there does need to be development, there does need to be repair, this can be uh, focused on areas where there isn't heritage that might be uh, damaged. Also, whilst working with architects was great, we thought we should start involving some more uh, different disciplines. And we started a project with the British Academy uh, Global Challenges Research Fund to look at how monuments uh, interlink with uh, these kind of free areas of, or zones of, uh, of, uh, of domains of kind of the monument. So the pre-monument phases, the subsurface, and how that links into the um, above ground, the architectural uh, monument. So it's interdisciplinary, so we've started to look at the geotechnical evidence. So what are the monuments built on? What's the subsurface soil like? Is this good for seismic resilience? Is it not? How are the foundations? Also, how are the early uh, cultural phases? What needs protecting? Are these in a state where they can be uh, preserved and looked after? And then again, looking at um, the actual st the structural engineers, the architecture, what's the traditional techniques? How are these uh, monuments uh, interlinked to their foundations and all these different domains? But also, as Kai was saying, how does this link into local communities? How do they see monuments? How do artisans and craft traditions link to these monuments for the future? And also, how do they interlink to the communities around them? Not just looking into the past or technical aspects of these sites. Also, how do we then approach the next disaster? Um, we've been working uh, with our colleagues to try and work on methodologies for the recovery of collapsed monuments and materials from these sites. Because once a monument collapses, there's instances where material is removed, but it's still heritage material, and it needs to be protected, and also the potential for it to be reused. So we developed uh, with uh, colleagues um, from the Department of Archaeology um, ways of looking at uh, 
recording heritage in a post-disaster situation where you may not have heritage professionals. So the armed police, the uh, military were involved in a training program to actually protect heritage and excavate and record fallen architecture. And this is really important because one of the issues is recycling is not just the authenticity of materials and actually reusing materials, it's materials that have been lost. Uh, it's the economic costs and the environmental costs because actually one, a brick for a heritage site to be of the same standard costs something around £1.34 to produce each brick. So actually the economic cost of actually producing this material to rebuild, but also the environmental cost of firing all those bricks is also a concern in this kind of post-disaster situation. Also we started to develop training handbooks which can be used and developed and we started to work on that programme to identify ways in which we could develop a quick and easy method for people to understand and uh, approach a site that had been damaged in a disaster. We also invited and worked with colleagues from throughout the South Asia, uh, the Sark region, because this mobility of people coming from different countries have shared um, uh, kind of backgrounds. So for instance, Myanmar is prone to earthquakes, Pakistan is prone to earthquakes, uh, you have issues of tsunamis, and also uh, post-conflict uh, um, issues with heritage. These ideas and kind of synergies of development help each other to kind of identify ways forward to protect heritage together as a group. And also in, in, in terms of this, it's the co-production, actually sitting together, working together and identifying the issues together, working on the ways in which to develop these methods that actually is suitable for different environments, different conditions, and actually helps us to enhance the protection of heritage and also disseminate this more widely. So we worked on an uh, exhibition in both Durham and Kathmandu to show this work and to highlight the um, issues of um, and the protection that heritage requires um, in post-disaster uh, situations and urban environments. Now, I'm just coming towards the end of this. I hope I'm not too uh, long. But these are the issues of heritage in post-disaster. They're very uh, media. Uh, uh, driven, you can see that the, they are these um, very uh, well covered. But what about the longer term threats to heritage, which aren't these kind of newsworthy stories? What about mega infrastructure projects? What about kind of the large scale development, which actually is ripping out and damaging heritage below the ground without recording? Um, such as this is the Orange Line Metro in Lahore, in Pakistan. This is uh, cutting right through the UNESCO World Heritage Site of the Shalimar Gardens. Again, it's the issue of the standing remains, although the, um, the, uh, their environment, their space is kind of uh, um, is disturbed by this work. There's no kind of impact, there's no idea of the impact this has on the subsurface heritage that's associated with these monuments and how that's actually affected. Also, there's other long-term things like pilgrimage. So we have the kind of positives and negatives. So there's the economic benefit to communities from pilgrimage, but also the issues of what this uh, pilgrimage and increase in numbers of people visiting sites can actually cause damage to heritage that people are actually coming to visit and venerate. Um, at Tillerico, one of the sites we're working at, it's thought to be a candidate site for Kapilavastu, the childhood home of the Buddha, we've been using archaeological techniques to, such as geophysics to identify subsurface heritage. This is then being developed by our colleagues at the University of Tokyo to think about where walkways could go which wouldn't actually damage heritage below the surface but actually provide pilgrims with routeways through these, uh, these heritage sites following the pathways of uh, pilgrims and uh, the inhabitants of the city of the past. You can see that just on the surface, this is a pathway running through the site. You can see this is a wall of a structure just on the surface. So if you think about the footfall of pilgrims walking through the site, visitors walking through the site, the potential for heritage to be damaged. So we're looking at ways of mitigating this. And this is one of the new non-intrusive and reversible walkways, which is raised above the ground which means that no heritage is damaged by digging through, 
but it also facilitates pilgrims and visitors the chance to walk around the site and actually enjoy the sites and engage with these sites. Also, it's about involving uh, local communities. It's about uh, providing information for people coming to the sites, but also about uh, providing uh, information about what heritage is there, what heritage needs protecting, but not only in physical heritage, but also in tangible heritage of the communities living in those areas. So as we were saying, as Kai was saying earlier, it's kind of not kind of restricting who gets to in, enjoy or who gets to uh, work at these sites or, in, or, or live at these sites or, or what kind of heritage gets promoted. It's this kind of democratic and involving more people providing information about local communities and their local traditions so they are incorporated too into these narratives. And this is the thing we've been working towards, this kind of cascade of developing site assessment in terms of how to protect heritage in many different ways. So the first is engagement, talking to communities, finding out about their sites, finding about how people interact with these sites, what are their concerns, what are their needs, the evaluation of the heritage that's there, and then from evaluating that heritage, looking towards exhibiting it, disseminating it, and once that's disseminating, then coming back and engaging with communities and looking at uh, ways forward again. So. Again, this work is only possible with uh, lots of partners and uh, lots of um, uh, generous uh, funding. And so I hope that what I've been able to show is the way that heritage is at risk, but that we are trying to work together with partners to develop ways that this can be protected uh, for uh, future generations, but also allow for the development of these sites so that they can be enjoyed and also can be of benefit to the varied uh, communities that use and uh, uh, visit these sites. Um, thank you very much. Um, so thank you very much for the insight you gave. And of course, it raised, for me at least, a lot of questions because it left a lot of things open, which has to do with the time you have to explain it. But anyway, I think there's some, some big questions and you started right at the end with it and you made a remark about the meaning of identity or the importance of identity. Uh, so this simple question would be why is cultural heritage important? You had some aspects now. And also referring to, to some remarks that came in behalf of conflicts of cultures. What is the role that uh, cultural heritage or world heritage at, at, the, at the big end of the thing really can play in these conflicts? Is there really anything that it can give to solutions? You mentioned something, so I really think it would be uh, interesting to get a little deeper into those aspects because uh, for the country here and the culture here, we are not really uh, that aware of uh, maybe that fact that also uh, buildings or monuments could really help in, uh, in conflict because we're not used to that anymore. And I get to that, that maybe cultural heritage here plays another role than in other cultures. So who would want to start? Should I go first? Yeah. <laughs> if you insist. I, I don't, but... <laughs> um, yeah, as, I think as I was getting to at the end of the, um, the short presentation there, um, cultural heritage is important because it means lots of different things to different groups, and it's often entwined with identity and obviously everyone has an identity and, and, and they and a lot of that is is reflected or invested in in the heritage and the built environment around around them I, I think that one of the um, uh, key issues is that heritage as I said it can be a economic driver and it can, it's also a social, um, has a social dynamic as well. And in terms of the pilgrimage sites we've been working at um, in, the, in, the, in the Terai, down in the south of Nepal, the heritage is important in terms of people's um, spiritual 
and kind of pilgrimage <coughs> ideals. They want to visit these sites, they want to experience these sites, but it's also <coughs> important because it has the potential for economic development for the communities who live um, by those sites and alongside those sites. So there's so many divergent aspects which are linked to these sites being in those locales that actually lead to um, the importance of uh, cultural heritage in that kind of, kind of aspect. I don't know if you want to jump in there, Kai, at all. Um, yeah, you sort of asked all, everything in one go. <laughs> so. um, well, yes, I think the, the, it's very clearly linked to, uh, you know, identity as a means of expression. And I think, uh, you know, it's, it's sort of a, a question of... Uh, right of expressing oneself and that's also linked to uh, you know within a certain context now uh, and like I mentioned what I, I find it really important that we look at uh, culture in the sense of ensuring continuity and uh, whenever we come up with uh, new ways of doing things uh, very often these are not tested. And in a context like in, in Nepal, let's say, we have a lot of uh, uh, sort of external um, organizations carrying out things within the context of Nepal, and very often this might not be compatible. So the question would be, how do we ensure this continuity within the context? And I think that is really very much linked to the local culture. Now, it's again the question of compatibility, identity, and expression. This again links to conflicts, because if we look at any conflict, or most conflicts, they are caused because of cultural issues. Whether it's religious, whether it's uh, differences in uh, the way people talk, believe, react, there, and you know, in most of these uh, these conflicts, it's a question of people understanding things differently, or expressing themselves differently, or misusing that difference also politically. But it always comes back to the question of expression, and I think here. Um, you know, we need to look at uh, not only the tangible heritage, which is sort of an outcome of this expression of, the cult, uh, of a specific culture, but also uh, that because these conflicts are actually created due to cultural issues, we need to resolve them by dealing with the cultural heritage. And uh, I mean, uh, especially like in Rakhine, where we're looking at the, the, the differences in cultural heritage, uh, the, the issue isn't just to conserve a monument, it's actually to get the people to start um, sort of linking back to that culture that they had and seeing how uh, that again can become part of the, the expression of their existence. So, so I think it's, it's, it's very complex, but it all sort of links together, and it comes back to that concept of continuity. We aren't trying to conserve something which is there as if it was in the past, but that it's something there is continuity, there is no break in it, there's continuity which then leads into the future. And I'm still, I'm still trying to see how that can be used in our whole approach to conservation, but it seems to really link up all these different concepts. So it's, yeah, so it's importance of continuity of cultural heritage. Can I just add something? Sure. And also the issue of identity being interlinked with that and conflict is sometimes the kind of negative aspects of world heritage is sites that then suddenly become targeted because they're linked to a certain expression. So for instance, the Temple of the Tooth in Kandy in Sri Lanka was targeted and bombed because it was seen as this kind of Sinhalese uh, Buddhist monument. Um, 
and there's been countless examples, uh, the Mustard Bridge, examples of heritage being targeted because it has those specific links to identity. And this is one of the kind of issues, again, of, 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 of world heritage. And again, as Kai was saying, how we actually approach that and how we actually use or, or, or think about cultural heritage in terms of, of peace as well and, and kind of resolving uh, conflicts too. And do you think, after your work, that there is a positive influence on, especially on that? You know, I also marked here: Can we overcome this destructive attitude that we see in in some religious uh, fundamentalist groups, or in fundamentalist if they're religious? Not a question, but when they destroy these things. And, and over the long term, there's really those uh, attempts that one tries to do with world, the world heritage sites help against such aggressions? I know this is the big one. <laughs> Sorry, in terms of... The, your, the whole activity around it, you, you say this, and also this... Uh, really uh, looking at the world heritage as, as a system for, for a society. Do these attempts really help uh, against that aggression that sometimes comes up? Or, as you mentioned, sometimes it's even a reaction to it. Sorry. Yeah, so I think, yeah, it's, it's about who is included and who is excluded. So it's about trying to have an inclusive approach so that people don't feel marginalized from heritage their heritage or others, and actually trying to work with methods like Kai was saying about this movement from kind of, kind of almost imposition of world heritage to actually bringing in communities. If, if, it's, if it's not kind of brought in and interlinked to the communities who, who live with it or, 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 or can actually be associated or a part with it, you're setting up these barriers, sometimes artificial, and it's a way of actually, we need to think about ways in which heritage can actually be more inclusive. I think that's the, that's the major way. Conflicts often come from people being marginalized and actually heritage needs to be yeah, inclusive and open to, to all to try and think about ways forward in this. I don't know if Kai wants to. Um, I've been dealing more with natural disasters than conflicts. And it's been interesting because we have uh, within ECOMOS uh, the Scientific Committee for Risk Preparedness and we're clearly divided into those dealing with conflicts and those dealing with natural disasters. And uh, the big difference is that in natural disasters uh, the question would be to get the community to work together to, in the rehabilitation phase. So there's no conflict within the communities, it's actually dealing with the natural calamity. While uh, the approach where we have destruction caused due to uh, conflict, it's actually not the destruction but the, the cause of conflict that one has to actually deal with. And the rehabilitation links much more to dealing with the human factor. And um, for example, the, 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 you know, all the World Heritage Sites in Syria were put on the danger list. Uh, I don't think it helped any whether it was on the World Heritage or not. Uh, they were bombed and destroyed. The question is what happens afterwards? And I guess some of these would be more highlighted and there's a lot of, uh, you know, the question of uh, resources going in for the, uh, the restoration, reconstruction of a lot of these sites. But I mean, a place like Aleppo, or where the entire you know city was absolutely destroyed, uh, you know whether it was World Heritage or not, I don't think uh, it made uh, any difference, except that it was mentioned on and off. Uh, but there was no way of stopping that within that conflict. Um, so very clearly, there. Major limitations, uh, and I don't think world heritage in those extreme circumstances uh, makes any difference. Okay, let, let's go to the other side, which is the side, let's say, of Switzerland or England. Huh? Well, we're in different cultures, 
hardly ever any disasters, fortunately, or not that big ones at least, and certainly not that many conflicts. Talking of Switzerland, I don't know what's happening in Britain in the next few years. But anyway, what is the role of, in, in a different culture that is sort of established, that is quiet, what is the role of, of, of world heritage in, in these different cultures? Is, is it just, I'm <laughs> getting a little bit, you know, uh, picky on that, is it really t just tourism or is there another role that one could see? And maybe the second part of that question is what could we learn of, of uh, other cultures and the meaning that uh, obviously world heritage, as you just pointed out, has there in our cultures? You live in a building like that, so you have to answer it first. <laughs> um, yeah, I think there is the aspect of economic impact of world heritage. I think that's one of the things that's, that is quite obvious and key. Many of the world heritage sites in the UK, at least, are um, tourist attractions or have been great uh, visitor sites already. So the new uh, inscription of the Lake District as a World Heritage Site links into what you already have of a, a national park. There's already visitors, but this is a way to, to draw uh, more visitors in or, 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 or lead on to um, uh, accelerating uh, that, that economic um, impact. It's, yeah, it's, it's an interesting question in terms of, is it a, uh, is, is it just for that? <laughs> like, I, I, I find it, uh, it's an interesting concept of how, you know, we are actually showing our, our, the universal values of heritage, their important sites, they have listings for, for reasons, we, you know, there's world heritage, it's world heritage because it's, it, it's everywhere, you know, we, 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 it's a it's a way of actually showing the uh, achievements of different cultures. Um, it's a good educational tool, finding out about our pasts, how we've come to where we have come to now. But I think in the modern situations, it, it does have a very large kind of uh, economic uh, drive behind it, and also. It's an economic drive for communities who live near those sites and also the education that these information from these sites can actually provide for the communities that actually live in these areas within uh, uh, the, the uh, surroundings of, of world heritage um, areas. Um, I think the big question is, you know, why do we have world heritage? And it's really one of the, the uh, conventions that is, uh, you know, uh, most successful uh, UNESCO conventions. And I think it's it's got to do with uh, the listing. And I think people love to see, you know, sort of a beauty pageant, uh, which are the, the the sites on the list and which are not. And you know, it, it just it's like a kind of a game. And, uh, and how many sites does this country have and how many sites does the other one have? And, you know, it, it's, it's, it's sort of interesting general knowledge. But the question is, is it more? I mean, does World Heritage provide, you know, better protection? Uh, you know, what is really the, the need for World Heritage? And uh, we are just uh, discussing the Reti uh, Shaban, which is a World Heritage. Uh, is it better protected because it's world heritage or is it just that it has a little extra status? Uh, is it really going to bring in more people to visit? Uh, on the other hand, I'm working on the railways in India where they were actually going to shut down that Darjeeling Himalayan railway and we convinced the Indian railways that they should put it on World Heritage, they got very excited, they put it on the World Heritage, and it's still functioning really only because it is World Heritage, otherwise it wouldn't be functioning anymore. Uh, now we are struggling to try to get them to actually protect it better, but it really was because of World Heritage that it still exists. While the Reiti Shaban, I don't think it changed very much it having been put on the World Heritage. So I think it's, it's a question of 
you know, are we looking at it as a tool or are we looking at it as sort of a beauty pageant? And very often the politicization of world heritage has led it off its actual track of providing this uh, better protection. Okay, well, as much as I can, uh, can see, I think at least it helps marketing if you're on that list a lot. We had that in, with the National Park where it was taken out of the biospheres and so slight problem on the marketing side and parts. But anyway, uh, okay, I have maybe one last or you know, last question before then the final one, but then I will open up uh, for, the, uh, for the, the, the people here, the audience, to, to also ask some questions. Now on, on some different uh, level, which is the, sort of the process that you, you went through. That you mentioned and you showed that multidisciplinary works is, 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 is the key model for that you're standing for now. It used to be slightly different, you know, and also I think the archaeology used to do its job and no one else was really doing anything after him or then we put it into a museum or whatever we did with it. But now this is a completely different approach that comes up which is an approach that not only in that field seems to be uh, very important, but I think just because it's important in other fields, maybe you could sort of uh, tell us how that works, who is involved, and how you really, how that works in reality. Uh, when you're there, uh, how you participate, how you participate over time, uh, this I think it would be really interesting and could just to highlight a little bit more on that. Um, yeah, I mean, it's been fantastic to actually be able to work with colleagues from different disciplines, find out their ideas, their methods, their, their theoretical ideas and backgrounds and link those all together. I think one of the issues that actually has come out of it is from working in, in Kathmandu with, with Kai and others, is actually looking into where funding after disasters comes to. And actually in terms of rehabilitation and reconstruction, there's not actually been much of the kind of pledged donations of money going towards the research aspects. So there's this issue of how important is research in the process of rehabilitation and reconstruction. And again, it links into these ideas of political pressure to rebuild, to reconstruct, the financial imperatives for reconstruction. And actually, we've talked about multidisciplinary work, and I, I think, I hope I showed the kind of importance of interlinking and understanding that biography of a monument or monuments of how they've have, have actually uh, been damaged and destroyed. But in terms of being able to kind of develop interdisciplinary projects, one of the issues has been actually finding. Um, pledges of financial support to be able to do that. And actually the work that we've done uh, through the UNESCO chair and our partners has been through quite small Global Challenges Research Fund uh, grants from the UK government. And unfortunately, those projects only last as long as the funding is available to, to do that. So one of the, the, the key issues that we've been noting is we've developed this kind of um, interesting uh, package where we can actually start to understand how the monuments that have been constructed, how they link to their earlier phases, how they link to their architectural traditions, the traditional kind of uh, engineering, and how that links to the soil conditions to try and understand why monuments may have collapsed, understand why monuments may have uh, continued standing. But actually there's no real program of actually supporting that interdisciplinary work. And um, one of the other issues is in terms of when you actually have um, projects developed, there's often um, an issue of linking up between different people working in different programs doing different pieces of work and actually trying to understand what different teams have done and getting that information and sharing that information in a post-disaster situation which is kind of a difficult situation anyway. Um, I think there's the, the kind of key, key difficulties to actually uh, moving forward with um, interdisciplinary work. But I think the work has a value. I think it's not only has a value in post-disaster situations, but in, in just general research. I think the linking between um, different knowledge bases and expertise is, is, is key for getting a holistic understanding of sites. 
Um, but it's whether we have the opportunity to actually develop those in the future for, for cultural heritage and its uh, protection and, and, and rehabilitation. Um, <clears throat> I deal with management of heritage sites, so actually I could go on and on and talk about this because the main issue here is <clears throat> in connection with uh, sort of this cooperation and collaboration between all the different uh, sort of all those involved. And uh, on the one hand, it's within the government, the central government and the local uh, site, usually World Heritage, since it's a convention, the central government signs the convention, but the implementation is done by the local government. So the whole question of how this functions within the, the government hierarchy. But then again, we're looking at, uh, you know, with management, the buffer zone management is usually linked to regional planning, urban planning, uh, we, you know, tourism uh, sector planning, disaster risk management, those are actual requirements for World Heritage. But then according to the different sites, we have, you know, archaeology, uh, we have agriculture, like in Bagan, it's the whole landscape. How do we actually deal with uh, maintaining an agricultural landscape around the monuments where we're dependent on the farmers to continue farming? Then we have the local economy the, and the community livelihoods, uh, which now we're again looking at sustainable development and linking that to the SDGs and seeing whether we can get funds from uh, the other sectors. Because uh, some of these sectors, they have a lot of money. I mean, uh, while from the cultural heritage sector usually doesn't have money. So it's a question of linking it all together. And usually the problem arises from the other sectors. So actually they should be paying for it. So this link between the different sectors becomes very critical in the overall management. Okay, thank you for that first. So now I would open for a few questions of the audience. And I would hand you the microphone. I was just wondering if it sometimes would happen that, uh, happen that the community says, no, <clears throat> I don't want your help. I can do it on my own. and. Um, I can also manage, manage it on my own, or I have my own vision. Like, how strong is the UNESCO? How much power does it have? And, um, like, it sometimes seems for me as if the UNESCO was its own state, a kind of own country, or like this. And it, it's how, yeah, I think also what you have mentioned, both of you, the intersection or the, the link between the community and the UNESCO. In, in detail. So it's UNESCO deal would be dealing with the central government and uh, I mean they try to get involved with local with communities and all but in a, in a certain sense that is not up to UNESCO to deal with. The UNESCO would actually be supporting the government at policy level uh, linking it, you know, maybe advising on overall governance in respect to these sites, but wouldn't be in a position to deal co directly with community. And we also have the same situation with the central government trying to deal with community. Very often that leads to conflict. So in most of the management cases, what we have been working on is to actually say that the central government deals with overall policy monitoring and it has to be the local government that deals with communities. Now, in many cases, we have actually seen that the, the responsibility for heritage, which used to be with the community, it was their heritage, has been taken away through legislation and the responsibility has taken, been taken over by the government. And I think then it becomes, it, it's, you know, that's where the conflict arises from. Like in Nepal, we had traditional uh, community-based organizations looking after the heritage. They owned land, which then the income from the land was used to maintain the, the monuments. Now, in the 1960s, they actually, uh, because the government wanted control over this land, they nationalized these uh, community-based communities to get control of the land 
And so the government took over that responsibility, and uh, which now is the problem that the government is dealing with the, the heritage. And I think in many places, these and that, that's what I was talking about, con continuity, there was a very often this break in how it was dealt with, with a new system that came in, such as new politics, new governance, new legislation. And now we're trying to actually go back to the community and say, no, you're the ones who should actually be looking after your own heritage. But very often certain links have been broken, but we need to redevelop these. And I think that's the most critical aspect of, of uh, how we can bring the community back uh, to look after their own heritage. And this has been again critical in Kathmandu after the, the, uh, the earthquake where we had the government and international communities coming in wanting to do all this. But actually, you know, the resilience lies only there where the community is actually involved. And uh, that has always been sort of the critical point that we needed to, to actually deal with. Any other question? Yes, um, I have another question about, uh, you mentioned the uh, Reti Sheban, no? And I think the Reti Sheban is a very interesting example. Um, but I wouldn't say that it doesn't change anything if an infrastructure um, becomes a UNESCO World Heritage or not. I was involved in a competition about the Albulat Tunnel and I can tell you that it changed completely. The attitude how um, to deal, for example, with the transformation of, uh, of, um, uh, of uh, UNESCO heritage because of, uh, of a functional need, because the, um, the trains are getting bigger and, and they didn't pass uh, through the original tunnel. So ha you had to build a new tunnel and you had to maintain um, the old entrances, the portals for the tunnel, for example, I think it changed completely um, the attitude um, how to deal with the monument. And in, the, in that sense, I have a question to you. For example, uh, I don't know if you know um, the case of the Bellinzona castles. The Bellinzona <laughs> castles, they were transformed, um, I would say, in a very interesting and uh, good way. Uh, before they became uh, World Heritage, I think, I guess so. At least uh, Mario Campi was dealing with the Middle Castle, then uh, Aurelio Galfetti was transforming the, the ca Castel Grande, and I think they were transformed in a quite radical way. I suppose uh, that this kind of transformation wouldn't be possible anymore as they are UNESCO World Heritage. And at the same time, I think that uh, one of the quality of these monuments is um, actually their transformation. Because the transformation um, um, was able to somehow relate them to the present, you know, to relate the historical monument to uh, present um, reality. And I think, uh, in this case, what do you think about that question? You know, because, of course, we are interested as architects. Is a transformation of a monument, um, if the protection level is that high as UNESCO, is it still possible, or should we just leave the fingers from it? Um, yeah, so, as I mentioned in my presentation, I always had a bit of difficulties agreeing to conservation as such, if there wasn't some rationale behind it. And, uh, and I think the, uh, we're, we're slowly ch changing our understanding of how we deal with these monuments. Now, there are certain monuments that we probably wouldn't want to change, like the pyramids. Uh, we, and, you know, uh, even the Taj Mahal, we, we, you know, we're having problems with uh, pollution and things, so we're trying to conserve it as it is. But we have a lot of uh, sites where, uh, especially where we have certain functions that we're putting in, uh, which require certain adaptations. And, uh, and again, it's coming back to that same point of, uh, you know, how can we ensure that whatever does take place 
is within this understanding of continuity and not uh, that we totally change it into something new. And I would say that in a lot of these sites, we have to ensure this continuity, especially wherever we have people uh, living, uh, you know, carrying out their daily activities. We have cities in World Heritage Sites. So, uh, so they will constantly be changed, but it has to be changed within the, the, the understanding of maintaining that which is the identity or the, the, the value of the site. And with Bellinzona, I don't know, yes, it's, it's a bit extreme, so I don't know whether, you know, <laughs> allowing that within the context of World Heritage would really be allowed. But uh, on the other hand, I think uh, it was still a wonderful <laughs> sort of adaptation. Uh, the question is whether World Heritage is the right tool to deal with that. So maybe it should never have become a World Heritage, or it's not within that understanding of World Heritage that Bellinzona should be assessed. So sometimes we say, yeah, maybe World Heritage needs to be only used in places where it really is effective. And it's not that we need to have, you know, in Switzerland we need to have at least 20 World Heritage sites, otherwise uh, we don't have the status required. Or, you know, it's not just this listing. And I think that's, the, the political side is a bit of a problem. But, uh, yeah, I fully agree. I think we need to allow change, but within this understanding of continuity. That's the architect now, the archaeologist. <laughs> yeah, that's a really interesting point you make, because you talk about the increase in visitors, the increase in interest in a site, and actually that often leads to an increase in development. And again, when we think about World Heritage, often what's listed and what people see is the above ground. And when you get development at sites, you often need infrastructure, like toilets for people to use, restaurants, other facilities. And these can be intrusive and dig down, actually destroy the archaeology below the ground. So one of the issues is, is that the protection of the monuments at these sites when they develop, it's not just the above ground, it's actually the below ground as well. The other interesting thing is when there's the focus on world heritage itself, actually the focus at the site where the listing is, because you've got people coming to the site and they have to come from somewhere. And if you get development of infrastructure, development of these kind of uh, you know, huge amounts of people coming through, there's a chance you're also going to damage sites on the routeways into these areas. So it's actually not only just thinking about the impact of the do these kind of developments of world heritage on the specific monument sites. It's actually also these areas around it. So like Kai was saying in Bagan, you have, you know, 4,000 monuments, is it? The last time you counted? It's, uh, yeah, it's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a huge amount of monuments above the ground, but it's also the spaces in between. So what happens when you have the infrastructure, <coughs> if these sites are developed, for people to come and see the monuments in certain places? So I think it's... Um, it's not just an issue specifically at World Heritage, it's also an issue in terms of heritage in general in these areas around too. Yeah. And there is a quite an interesting situation uh, in a city like Berlin uh, as dealing with the question of history and transformation in history and it's dealing with the Polish embassy that is in Unter der Linden is not a masterpiece of architecture, but it is uh, under protection by uh, Germany because it is a witness of a period of time of this Cold War. And so for this is under protection because it shouldn't be any more like this. On the other hand, for the Poland, for the Polish people, uh, this is uh, a problem. They don't accept uh, this building because it's a witness of a Cold War. So for the same reason, there is a group of, or a country, or a group of people accepting the situation and wanting to defend this as a heritage, as a memory of a moment. And on the other hand, you have the same, for the same reason, the refusal of this. So in a case like this, a structure like a UNESCO is not under protection in this sense, is not under world heritage, but how would work a system like a UNESCO? In this case, or to say, who is going to decide what is right and what is wrong? What is good and what is bad? 
For example, there are quite a few sites that have been put on the World Heritage List, not as uh, something uh, more in the sense of it uh, representing something in the past which should we should remember, but it should never happen again. I mean, for example, the Hiroshima uh, uh, Dome, uh, which uh, was inscribed just purely according to Criteria 6, which is actually, it's, it's just the symbolism it has. So it's not even actually the site itself, but the meaning of the site in respect to the, the, the nuclear uh, bomb explosion and destruction. Now, uh, there, there was a bit of a conflict between Japan and the, the US because uh, they dropped the bomb. But uh, it was, uh, they somehow resolved that. And, uh, but then we have, you know, other sites. With World Heritage, we have some issues. Uh, for example, Jerusalem, the, the, it's an ongoing conflict. But I guess we've agreed that th there is this conflict and trying to keep it uh, sort of under control. Um, there was an issue uh, of, uh, you know, Palestinian sites being inscribed under Palestine. Uh, so UNESCO got into trouble because they recognized Palestine. So uh, the U.S. has stopped its funding to UNESCO because of this decision. Uh, but it was basically voted by uh, the, the UNESCO Council that uh, Palestine was a state party. So there are always these conflicting <laughs> issues that come up. Now, for example, it wasn't world heritage, but uh, memory... Uh, of the world. There's another listing where the Nanjing massacre uh, uh, was include uh, some artifacts or the documentation of the Nanjing massacre uh, was put on the list of the memory of, uh, of the world and uh, Japan protested because of course it was the Japanese who, who actually uh, caused the massacre. And uh, that has led to a, a big conflict as well. Uh, so it came up, it was put up by China. It was inscribed on that list uh, and uh, against the, the, the Japanese. Uh, but then Japan has put a site of the Meiji industrial development, which includes sites where uh, Korean, uh, during the war, Korean interns were there and also the misuse of uh, uh, Koreans and the whole history the, to, of the war. And that got on the World Heritage list even though the Koreans protested. So I mean there's a lot of these, uh, uh, I think in every story there's always someone who profits from it and someone who actually loses out in it. And, uh, and uh, I guess that is the whole politics of it. And uh, the question would be to find some means of uh, a solution, but uh, it's usually very difficult. But more or less, the, the point is that it's not UNESCO deciding, it's the whole process of nomination and it's the World Heritage Committee deciding. And it depends who's on the committee. Okay, any other questions? Um, I was I was very much intrigued uh, by your concept of uh, not freezing monuments but um, <coughs> giving them a certain continu continuity and a future within a certain society. Um, and you were also talking about craft um, in order to you know maintain these buildings, these monuments, um, and keep them alive. Um, of course, you need a certain craft and um, knowledge to do this. But that means that you also need to keep alive the craft. That knowledge, is that done? Are you working, you know, with kind of in education? Is there craft that is protected? Is, um, you know, <laughs> cultural activities also part of um, world heritage? I don't think it's obvious in the sense that uh, I think it's something that we're working on now. Um, 
in respect to specifically our work, uh, I've been sort of fighting for this in the last three years since the earthquake, three and a half years. And it's only recently that we've actually, after three years of conflict and discussion, we've started the reconstruction of Kastamando, the monument that uh, Chris presented. And uh, so what the idea is to actually reconstruct it using as much of the material that we salvaged as possible but based on traditional technology, which means that we have the artisans deciding on how it's going to be done. And, uh, and that we need to have all the engineers and the other experts trying to understand and justify that. So it was interesting that within the first year, we had structural engineers who basically said, that the foundations were not sufficient. Now these foundations have been there for 1,300 years in perfect condition, and according to the calculations, they were not sufficient, and they wanted to put in concrete piles to strengthen it. And so more or less we said, no, it can't be. I mean, you know. And now we, again, the re most recent calculations show that these are perfect foundations and uh, they're built in such a way that they're sort of uh, in three different uh, circular uh, walls. And the four main posts are on individual uh, foundation pillars. So they're actually, they can move separately and they're not even connected fully. And uh, somehow they calculated this, this is actually uh, an ideal foundation. Now, I'm not quite sure who calculated what and how it worked out, but clearly the traditional uh, technology they must have learned over centuries was really the most efficient. The question is, how do we justify it? And, and I think we need to learn sort of the, the means of communication between you know, the architects and structural engineers and those with the modern thought process uh, how do, can they communicate with the artisans? And I think that's one of the things that I'm really working on at the moment. On the other hand, the artisans themselves are losing a lot of traditional knowledge and we need to try to see how we can uh, document this. And uh, traditionally it's been always orally transferred to the next generation, but that's not working to well, to, you know, the apprenticeship. But very interesting that we see women working on, for example, wood carving, which was traditionally never the case. So things are changing slightly and adapting, but very clearly there is still this tendency for continuity, but we again have to establish the means for these artisans to uh, earn enough money to actually survive. So again, we need to allow the system to be developed for them to be supported. And this whole thing isn't, is sort of slowly falling apart and we have to try to ensure that it is maintained. And it is a big, big struggle, but I think it really is something that has to take place. Yeah, I mean, I'd just like to re reiterate that, that the monuments are nothing without the craftspeople who build them. There is intrinsic to the value of the monument as the actual, you know, bricks, mortar, and timber as well. And it's also an interesting thing of kind of this uh, renewal of monuments as well. It's getting away from thinking of monuments as static, and they're built, and then that's it. Because there's also the complex biographies of monuments too, so it's... It's not only the renewal of, of, of wood if it becomes rotten or repairs, it's also how those monuments have developed over time. And I think another key question is in the rebuilding process, which I think Kai's been working on a lot, is what monument are you rebuilding? Which phase of its reconstruction is actually occurring? Because a lot of the, I know in some instances there's monuments that fell in 34, which were rebuilt quickly in a Rana style. And now the question is, if they're rebuilt, should they be rebuilt in the traditional style, or should we actually be looking at them being built in the style of the monument that's collapsed previously? So I think it's 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 as as Kai says, it's absolutely 
key to, to, to think about how the communities, the artisans, actually link to these monuments. Not only the craft traditions, but also the intangible values linked to monuments as well. You know, the, the festivals and the uh, kind of you know, places that these monuments hold, there's locales and the landscape as well, and how they fit into the communities and how the communities use them too. And I think that's a really key thing that we have to think about with, with heritage, that again, yeah, they're not just static monuments, they are living sites which have traditions associated with them, which we might not see when we visit them, but they're certainly uh, there and they're key and really important. Okay, I think this might be a sort of a good end to it. Let's do also for me a key point that, that comes out of, of the discussion and your remarks today. I think buildings hold a lot of human knowledge and uh, so maybe their existence, you, you said it in, in several times, their existence and keeping them existent guarantee a certain, in a certain way the continuity of our human culture overall. So maybe, of course, it's a big word, the human culture, and we have to sort of know what it means, what it means. But in that way, I think it was a very successful evening at least for me, I hope also for you. I thank our two guests here for coming from not that a long way and a long way uh, to Switzerland, but you, so since you have Swiss background, I'm sure you knew what you wanted to do when you were here once again. And uh, thank you very much. I hope from here to hear from you on other occasions also it was very interesting. And Let's have a drink now, and then I think we also have some, something to eat, hopefully. Thank you very much.